So last week we talked about the, the uh, believer's walk of victory, the believer's walk of victory, and in such we highlighted uh, in that as we were going through uh, from verses 12 through 18, we covered last week, and we were uh, really talking about and highlighting working out our salvation as it talks about in verse 12, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But we also covered God working in us, that there's a working out of our salvation, but it comes really initially by God working in our lives, by responding to the Holy Spirit, by responding to the Word of God, by recognizing that I need a fresh work of God in my life. Do you all recognize that we need a fresh work of the Lord in our lives? You know, what makes me think of that is when the Israelites were going through the desert, those 40 years, not that it takes 40 years to get from Egypt to, to uh, uh, the Holy Land or to, the, you know, the, uh, to Israel, the land of promise. It's not that it takes 40 years to get from Egypt to there. It's that it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And while they are traveling, going through the desert, and God had provided them manna. He gave very specific instructions to them in regards to the manna. That you only take, you only gather what you need for the day, right? You only take what you need for the day. Why? Because that's a matter of trusting God. God will provide tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. It says in the New Testament, today has enough of problems of its own, right? Doesn't it? We got enough of problems today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. We'll handle tomorrow when tomorrow comes, right? And he provides them the manna. He says, don't take more manna than you need for the day. Take what you need for your family. Don't let it hang over till tomorrow. You know, the other lesson that I see in that, though, is that we can't live on yesterday's manna. We can't live on yesterday's food. Hey, that time that I spent in God's Word yesterday was great yesterday, but today's a new day. I need the Word of God in my life today. I need the Holy Spirit to work in me today. The word of God pouring into me today. What I had yesterday was good for yesterday, but today is a new day. Hey, I look at that with food. Hey, what I ate yesterday was good for me yesterday, but that doesn't mean I'm not eating today, right? And God's gonna provide what I need for today. And God's gonna provide that manna for Israel today, just as he did yesterday. We can't live on yesterday's manna. God works in us and we are to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. So we highlighted those things last week. We highlighted the Lord uh, telling us that we are to shine as lights in verse uh, 15. Shine as lights and reflecting the Lord in our lives to everyone that we come in contact with. But today we're going to begin with two men faithful in ministry. Two men faithful to the call, faithful to the Apostle Paul, shining as lights, you know, uh, holding fast the, uh, the word of, of life. These two men, these two men are recognized, are being recognized by the Apostle Paul, recognized, appreciated. Don't we appreciate when people are faithful? When there's faithfulness in the workplace, when someone who says they're going to do a job does it, when someone who says they're going to be there, they're there, when someone's, you know, we appreciate it. We appreciate when politicians do what they say they're going to do. That happens all the time, right? Yeah, right. No wonder we're constantly reelecting them, right? We're like, okay, get this guy or this gal out. We got to try this over again. And then we, the same thing that seems to happen, you know? We appreciate faithfulness. Those around you and around me appreciate faithfulness. Faithfulness in ministry. Faithfulness to a friend. You want to have a good friend? Be a better friend. You have no friends? Maybe it's because you're not being a friend. Maybe it's because you're a loner. Maybe it's you know, any number of things. Don't expect it all to come to you. You be the friend. 
You go out there. You, what was that? Was it AT&T? I don't know. Reach out and touch someone, you know? Don't like touch, you know, you, you get it. So be faithful. Be faithful. And they were faithful. And they were recognized, these men that we're going to talk about, recognized in their faithfulness. They were appreciated, these men were. They were noted by the Apostle Paul and serve as examples for us to follow. There's all kinds of examples. Some examples are for us to follow, right? Some examples are like, I don't want to follow that example, all right? I prefer when other people make mistakes and I learn from their mistakes, Isn't that always better, learn from someone else's mistakes? We read a lot about people's mistakes in the Bible. We read a lot about people's shortcomings and failures, about people's sin. We read about all these kinds of things. When we read about people's failures, understand that failure isn't who you are. You you don't say to people, you're a failure. No, people do things that are failure. You know, I failed in what I did. It doesn't make that person a failure unless they continue to not learn from those failures and continue to live that way. But, let, but let's look here. These men weren't failures. These men, rather, were faithful. We can apply this in every area of our life. We can apply this in marriage. We can apply this in friendship. We can apply this in the workplace. We can apply this in ministry. We can apply this literally everywhere. Faithfulness is so important and so vital. We need more faithfulness, righteousness, endurance. Verses 19 through 24 talking about Timothy, young pastor Timothy. But I trust in the Lord Jesus, the Apostle Paul is saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father he served me in the gospel. Therefore I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. Remember Paul here, um, well, footnote, Paul was in chains. He was chained to a Roman guard under house arrest, the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he was not able to minister personally at the church in Philippi, the Philippian church, where he had been before, obviously. And so he's got those that are in charge, those that are heading things up, those that he's sending teams even. He sends down there to minister. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Now, Timothy, as we said, was a young pastor. He's a young man of God, loved the Lord, served the Lord, faithful in ministry, faithful to, to the apostle Paul. And Paul had regarded young pastor Timothy as a son in the faith. He really raised him up, you know, in the faith. It's a, it's a wonderful thing when you take someone along and you disciple them in the Lord, you know, to disciple them, to say, hey, you know what? You're younger than me in age, perhaps, or you're younger than me in, in uh, your age in Christ, you know, how long you've been a Christian for. And you see someone willing and you see someone eager, you know, and you just, you pour into them and you disciple them. In the ways of the Lord. We see that in the New Testament. That the older men are to do that to to the younger men. And the older women are to do that to the younger women. Discipleship is so important in the body of Christ. Didn't Jesus after all say, go and make what? Disciples. Make disciples. So that implies, much more than implies, the need for discipleship. And Timothy was certainly discipled in many ways by the elder, the apostle Paul. He was faithful. He was one who Paul could trust. He had the heart of a true shepherd. Wherever you find yourself in church, whether this church or another church, in this town or another town, you need to look for a faithful shepherd. 
There are certain things that are key to ministry. Dog and pony show and entertainment nature of many churches today is not what the New Testament church was ever like. The church was under persecution, and the church is under persecution again today, and that persecution is growing globally. And it is growing, in fact, even nationally as well. We've talked about that. We know where it's all going to go. We've read the end of the book, so to speak. But we also know beyond that, we know that the Lord will return. The ten thousands of his saints, we know that things will get worse, but they will ultimately get better for his church and his faithful. Here we go again. Faithfulness. When you find yourself in a church, you look and you make sure that that church is doctrinally sound. That means it not only has the right doctrine, but it's teaching it. You make sure that the worship is glorifying to God, not just entertaining to you. Worship is not about you. Victoria Olstein said that worship was about us. No, worship is not about you, unless you're the one being worshipped, and then that's another problem. Worship is not about you. Worship is about God. He's the focus, you see. Make sure the worship is in line, ultimately, with the Word of God. Very important. You make sure that the pastor, the shepherd, has a heart for the people. Very important. To love the sheep, to love the flock, to be there in and out. In tough times, in easier times, whatever it may be, to love the flock is vital. That's Timothy. He loved the flock. He had a heart for the people. He was doctrinally sound. A true shepherd must be a true shepherd in every way and not just the appearance of one. There are many shepherds today. Many shepherds today, many shepherds today in Las Vegas community. Some who love the Lord and some who really do not. Some who love the Lord and some who really do not. Some who love the flock and some who really do not. Sad to say. Shepherds of actual sheep, talking about out there in the the field, shepherds of actual sheep, we read in the book of Genesis, were despised by the Egyptians. Like there was nothing lowlier. Like think of any kind of trade you can think of today. Think of that and that's like the lowest, you know, job, the lowest trade, whatever you can think of. Being a shepherd was even lower than that. It was the lowest of the lowest of the low. And yet, God's people tended sheep, among other things. Interesting, but when we talk about tending actual sheep and shepherds were greatly despised by the Egyptians, and not only by the Egyptians, they were just greatly despised. It was so, so lowly of a thing, like who would do uh, such a thing? You know, it was, it was really a very dirty job taking care of sheep. Sheep are very dirty. It was a very lowly job taking care of them. It was a very thankless job taking care of sheep. Dealing with disobedient sheep. Dealing with wayward sheep. Mending the wounds of the sheep. Looking out for those that were, and trying to fend off those wolves that would come to prey upon those dirty, disobedient sheep. And we think that sheep are all so cute and so, they're so cute and lovely and everything. I'll be honest with you, a couple of my favorite Christmas ornaments, I've got these two little fuzzy little sheep things. I don't know what it is. I've always loved these. She, Kathy hates them. She tries to hide them so that I don't see them to put them on the Christmas tree. And I, I don't know. But I don't know. I just like these sheep. But they always look so cute. They always look so peaceful. And yet they're so difficult and dirty. And God in his word says, we are like sheep. Isn't that just wonderful? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that encouragement. I'm like a difficult, dirty, wayward sheep. Yes, yes. Easy prey for the enemy. Easy prey for the enemy. 
and yet we're called sheep. And I, I mean, we don't want to be called like a, like a lion, right? Or, or uh, I don't know, something, a gazelle, I don't know, something, but a sheep, like serious, you know? But that's the reality. It shows something about what we deal with, with other people. No, what we deal with, with ourselves. We're sheep. God's people, the congregation are compared to these cute, adorable sheep. Numbers chapter 27, if you look on the screen, verses 16 through 17. It says, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation who may go out before them and go in before them and who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. Wandering isn't a good thing, isn't it? I've been there. You've probably been there. Probably we've all been there. Wandered. Wandered. Before we came to the Lord, we were wandering, looking, searching, trying to find this thing, that trinket, that high, that, you know, any number of things to fit a void in our heart that only God was designed to fill. You know? Wandering. Sometimes Christians can wander. We read of Jonah, and he surely wandered from where God told him to go. God told him to go to Nineveh. He literally got on a ship and went in the complete 180 opposite direction. God says, go there. Okay, I'm going there. I don't like what you're wanting me to do right now. You're wanting me to tell those people that there's hope, that there's salvation for them. I don't want to tell those people that because those people have abused my people. He wasn't a part of, didn't want what God's plan was right there. Well, he learned very quickly that he had to be a part of God's plan. God is sovereign. God is in control. And God will steer us around however he needs to steer us around. Maybe you've been wandering as a Christian, wandering in your faith, floundering in your walk. Faithfulness is so important. Faithfulness is so vital. And we see that even here it says, set a man over the congregation. The congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. In our households, there needs to be shepherding that takes place. You're the head of your household, then lead your household in the grace, in the mercy and grace and love of God. Lead your household, but by all means, lead and disciple and shepherd. We may remember the shepherd boy David, who even in regards to his own father, when the prophet was told by the Lord, go to the house of Jesse and I will direct you as to which of his sons, many sons, which of his sons will be the next king, would be the second king of Israel. And he goes there and of course he goes, you know, well, let's look at the oldest one. And, you know, he's a good looking guy and he's older and, you know, he's put in his time, you know, and he's got some, some rank and seniority. Surely it must, the, the spirit of the Lord must be upon him. It must be him. I was like, no, eh. I just hear the buzzer go off, like some game show, eh. you know, no, not that one. And then, well, the next one, and, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, see, oh, yeah, this one looks, this one has the right personality. Oh, that one's a talker. He'd be great, you know, in, in, you know, in politics or, no, whatever it might be. And then finally, God's like, no, not that one, not that one, not that one, you know. I'm sure the prophet's scratching his head. The father of these sons is scratching his head like, I, I, I don't know. And then, He's like, well, this is what God has told me. Do you have another son? Am I missing somebody here? Oh, yeah, there's the one out in the field. Now, remember now, he was directed, bring all your sons in. But he purposely left the one out in the field. You know who the one was out in the field? David. The shepherd boy, David. Because shepherds were so not regarded. But man, if you can learn how to shepherd those fluffy little sheep and do it well, then that's a life lesson for shepherding people, for leading people. It makes me think of the Karate Kid, remember? 
wax on or wax off and, and, and paint the wall and whatever we had to do with the floor there. And, and you know, the, Mr. Miyagi is, 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 is training the kid, you know, and the kid's getting so frustrated. And finally, the kid just blows up at him. Like, what's wrong with you? You're supposed to be teaching me how to do karate. You're teaching me how to be your slave and to, to take care of the floor and paint the, you know, or, or you know, refinish the floor and, and paint the walls or the, the, whatever it was, the fence and wax the car. And everything. I'm just your slave. You're teaching me nothing. And then Mr. Miyagi, he's like, okay. And then he starts, oh, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And then really gives him a lesson like, you know, oh, you were teaching me. It's life lessons, life lessons, life lessons, life lessons. What's your life been this past week? Think about it. Good, bad, and different, in between. Trials, tribulations. Maybe you're up on the mountaintop. Maybe you're in the valley. Maybe you're somewhere in between. Any number of things, but all the things that filter into our life are life lessons, and God ordained them to be. For us to learn, for us to grow, for us to mature, for us to trust God. Life lessons. But even David's own father didn't even regard him. Oh, he's the youngest. You know, he's out there. Oh, you mean, oh, Laurent out there taking care of Okay, I guess, you know. What do we got to lose? He's the last one, you know. And lo and behold, that's the one that was anointed of the Lord. How many times we can overlook this one or that one based on any number of things, the way they carry themselves or the way they dress or their age, they're too young, or they're too old, or here we've got this kid, he was a teenager, anointed by God, amazing, just absolutely amazing. This teenage boy was more brave, or would prove himself to be more brave than all the armies of Israel, than all the grown, trained men of war in Israel who would not do battle against Goliath, the Philistine. They were chicken. They wouldn't do it. And there was this whole thing, and I'm not going to go through the story that would take place. But finally, when word came to David, when David recognized when he was bringing food to feed his brothers who were supposed to be doing battle out there, and he's like, wait a minute. This guy is making a mockery of our God. And he's making a mockery of the people of our God. That's us. And you guys are just going to stand for this and do nothing? He was a man who was willing to do something. I would rather see a man who's willing to do something and fall flat on his face and see a bunch of chickens do nothing. Don't you agree? It's better to see someone try and fail than even fail to try. To get out there and to do something. And he's like... I'm going to do everything. I, I'm not going to allow this guy, this Philistine, this heathen to make a laughingstock of my God. That's the respect that he had for his God, our God. And he got out there and God used this ruddy, untrained at war teenager with a silly slingshot and a stone. And brought that thing down. Just amazing. God wants to make use of people like you and me. Don't take regard of yourself for how young you are, how old you are, how untrained you are, any number of things. Anyone can make excuses. But it takes someone with a heart like David to make a difference. Isn't it better to make a difference? Isn't it better to try? Isn't it better to do something? Timothy was a man like that. We also read in God's Word that David was a man after God's own heart. Now this shepherd is he who said, when you look in Psalm 23, verse 1, a psalm of David the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Or in other words, I shall want for nothing. You recognize when you truly understand the shepherding of God in your life, you want for nothing. You need nothing else because you recognize all you need is him. Do you, do you understand that? Do you recognize that? All you need is him. Well, I need my health. 
No, you don't. What? No, you don't. The moment we're born, the clock is ticking. The question is not, are we going to go? The question is, where we're going to go. That's the question. Where are we going to go? Well, Jesus is my ticket out of here. You know? The Lord is my shepherd. I have want for nothing. I have want for food, no. Want for health, good health, no. I mean, yes, we want things. And yes, God provides things according to his sovereign plan. But truly, all we must really want as a child of God is the Lord. We also see poor examples of shepherds in Scripture. Ezekiel uh, 34, verse 8 would be an example here. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no, what? Shepherd. Men who failed to do what God has called them to do. We see that all over the place. The biggest problem in families today is men. So ser being serious, I'm not attacking men, you know, but, but hey, if the man is the head and we see families falling apart, well, where, you know, where does the buck stop? The majority of the problem in families, I'm not saying that there's no problem or sin to share, to go around. I'm saying that normally the majority of the problem is men who fail to lead, men who fail to disciple. We see that in churches. We see that in government. Men that are more interested in getting the vote instead of standing up for what's right. It's so important that men act like men. Yeah, actually, some of you guys remember, we, we actually did a, a Bible study on that um, in our men's group. Act like men. Because there was no shepherd. Nor did my shepherd search for my flock. Why? Because flock go astray. But the shepherds were too preoccupied with other things. The shepherds are to be taking care of the congregation, not to be supposed to be taking care of themselves. Nor did my shepherds search my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. And we see that Jesus is the shepherd. He's the mold by which we are to follow. Matthew 9, 36 says, but when he, Christ, saw the multitude, multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because he's a true shepherd. Why was he moved with compassion for the multitudes? I'm glad you asked that question. Because he's got a shepherd's heart. The shepherd actually has a shepherd's heart. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Remember what we read in Ezekiel? John 10, 11, I am, the holiest name of God, I am, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's a real shepherd, a real shepherd who's willing to sacrifice, a real shepherd who follows the example of Christ. Timothy was following the example of Paul. Paul was following the example of Christ. Timothy was with Christ as well. But he was also discipled by Paul. So I'm saying all this so that we have an idea, an understanding, really, of what a good shepherd is and what a bad shepherd is. A shepherd that's present and a shepherd that's absent. Where's the shepherd? There are churches all over Las Vegas today that have churches and there's no pastor behind the, the pulpit. You watch on the video screen and you watch the pastor who's pastoring from some multi-site campus because we don't want to call it a church because the name church could offend people, you know. And he's supposedly pastoring from some multi-church campus. You've got that many churches, then you should be raising up and discipling men to lead those churches. Then there's a discipleship problem, man. I'm just being honest with you. You know, I mean, it's just, we've got to take God's word for what it is, right? It is what it is. God's word is true, right? God's word is true. God's word says, let every man be true, or let, let God's word be true, and every man a what? Liar, okay? And you go to many of these churches today, and there's not even the pastor behind the pulpit. He's gone. He's not there. You just watch the video. Isn't that wonderful? You know, how do you really watch out for a, shot, a, a, a flock like that? I got the answer for you. You don't. You don't. It's not God's model of building a church. It's God, it might be man's model of building their kingdom, but it's not God's model of building a true church. 
Not a biblical New Testament church. It's just not. It's not there. It has nothing to do with the technology. Technology is great. We can use technology to our advantage in many areas. But technology is not to replace what God does, what God has, what God directs in God's word. Pastors and shepherds are to care for the flock, to love the flock, to sacrifice themselves in every way needed, even up to and including their own lives if need be. That is biblical. You know, we see maybe a more modern day, another example for each of us. Pastor Chuck, Pastor Chuck Smith, he said that his desire was that his flock was the best fed and the most loved. You got to feed the flock. You got to love the flock and you can't do it if you're not there. If you're gallivanting all over the, the world, if you're, you know, on, you know, multi-site this and that and everything else, if you're not teaching the word, then you're not feeding them. Because we see in the word of God that how we are fed as Christians, my friends, is by the word of God, right? It's the word of God. That's how we feed. And if the word of God is not expounded and is not taught, then you've got a lot of people coming, a lot of people feeling good. But there's a serious problem in here. A serious problem in here. They're malnourished. We see that all the time. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Again, Christ is truly our examples, or our example, I mean. Shepherd the church. Shepherd the church of God. There's a responsibility before God in shepherding the, ch shepherding the church. I'll say that a few times really fast. I've always said before to people, you know, you know some, some people, you know, know two languages, three languages. I'm like, I'm still trying to master the English language, you know. It's so important for a pastor, shepherd, leader, in the broader sense, leader. It's so important to have those surrounding that individual that they trust. So vital, really, for a pastor to have those around him who also will love and nurture the flock, to instruct the flock, to correct the flock, to lead the flock, Fortunately, that can be a rarity. It was even a difficulty, even in the time of the very early church and the time of the apostles. It was even a difficulty then. Well, we know that sin grows and sin increases, right? How much more difficult is it today? If it was as difficult as it was in Paul's day, oh my, Paul would freak if he saw what the modern church in America is like today. But unfortunately, again, that can be a rarity. Paul was already hard-pressed to find such a one, to find such a, a, a one that was so faithful, but he found that in Timothy. He found that in Timothy. Timothy, even as we look back in uh, uh, verse 15, shone as a light in the world. A bright light, even in the body of Christ. Now here when we look in verse 21, again, uh, for all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. He's talking about pastors here. Do you understand that? That's specifically who he's talking about, pastor, shepherd. We can carry it out a little further if we would like in the broader, looser sense to uh, uh, leaders, but specifically to pastors and shepherds. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. That's a problem. That's a problem. It existed then. It exists even more, I believe, today, at least in America. And we see pastors living, you know, uh, this, this kind of lifestyle of, of, of you know, being a, a showman, 
you know, living, the, uh, living like this, I don't know what you want to call it, this persona of, uh, you know, remember Robin Leach's lifestyles of the rich and famous, you know? Well, if he was still doing that today, he would have a number of these rock star pastors doing that. Like I said last week, we do need a rock star, but it's not a human. We just need the Lord. Let the Lord be your rock star. Don't look to another man. That man's going to disappoint you. You look to another man, you're going to be so disappointed. You're going to be so disappointed. Just look to Christ. Look to Christ. It says, keep your eyes fixed on what? Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the author. He's the perfecter. He's the one that we keep our eyes fixed on. He's the one in which we look to. Keep our eyes fixed upon. I read so many articles today where they're calling some of these celebrity pastors. Watching things on the news and on TV and a celebrity pastor so-and-so and celebrity pastor so-and-so. When on earth was it ever a, a celebrity position to be a pastor? You can go to, go to the Sudan today and, t- and tell those pastors there that they're celebrities. They'll probably spit in your face. How offensive it would be to call them such a thing. They're suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The women are being raped because of their testimony in Jesus Christ. Horrific things are taking place. No, they're not celebrities. Christ has called us to die to self, not to celebrate self. And it's sad when the world looks and sees celebrity pastors. It should not be so, my friends. It is not biblical. It is wrong on every single level. Celebrity pastors who have their own jets, drive six-figured cars, you know, I could go on and on and on. I remember one of them who had, you know, a, a specially fitted doghouse for his dog and, and uh, gold-plated, um, genuine 24-karat gold-plated uh, bathroom fixtures and all this opulent kind of stuff. That's a sham. It's a sham. That's not real church, my friends. It's just not. Now, in verse 22, and so, hey, I got to call it for what it is, right? We got to bring it home. If this is what the Word of God is saying, now verse 22, but you know his proven character, Timothy's. He's like a, a diamond in the rough. You know? you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. And again, Timothy was genuine. And he had that, that character, that Christ like character. It was evident. It was evident. You know, when you talk of character, Socrates said, let him that would move the world first move himself. First move himself. Ann Landers, remember her? The true measure of a man is how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. Mm. In other words, oh, I have nothing to gain from you. And that's perfectly fine. I'm going to love on you. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to value you, whether I have anything to gain from you or not. And that's Ann Landers. President Woodrow Wilson said character is a byproduct. It is produced in the great manufacture of daily duty. Interesting. So now moving on to Epaphroditus, and we'll close in this section here shortly, very shortly. Epaphroditus is being acknowledged, noted, praised, so to speak, again, as another great man of God, a faithful man of God. Let's read, yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker and fellow soldier. But your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Because he just loved Epaphroditus. That's a wonderful man, just such a neat guy, a trustworthy man, a brother, faithful. Verse 28, therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. 
Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. Hold them in esteem. Don't worship them. Okay, don't kiss the ground that they walk on. You know, don't puff them up. But respect a man like that. You find a man like that, you respect a man like that. You tell them, I, I, I value who you are in Christ. I value that. When was the last time you said to that to somebody? When was the last time you saw a man of God, a man just honoring God, not a perfect man. There's no perfect, there's one perfect man, it's Jesus, right? So don't look for that man to be perfect, okay? But a man who has a heart and a passion for God and for the body of Christ, when was the last time you acknowledged that? Because we're very quick, I mean, it's very easy, right? Hey, comment cards in, uh, well, at least back in the day, this goes back decades and decades ago, when restaurants would hand out comment cards, now it's all online, right? Comment cards. Very rare when people have a great experience that they share it. But if something is just slightly less than, than desirable, oh, it's coming. Ah, you know, I want to see the food and beverage director. I want to see the chef, the, you know, whatever it is. And hey, if there's a problem, then, then talk about the problem. I get that. I get that. But hey, if there's some, that, something worthy of praise, right? Give praise where praise is due. Give praise where praise is due. It's very encouraging. It's very encouraging. It's a good thing. Receive him in the Lord with all gladness. Hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ, he came to death, close to death, not regarding his life, because he's got a heart of a leader. He's got a heart for people. He's got the heart of Jesus. To supply what was lacking in your service toward me. I appreciate how Paul calls Epaphroditus a fellow worker and a fellow soldier. You know, it's not only what he calls him, but it's what he didn't call him. He didn't say, he's my employee. He works for me. He's on my board. I'm the grand, you know, poobah of, you know, whatever it might be. He, called, he says, fellow worker. We're putting them on, on this equal plane here. Now, yes, as an apostle, we all know and Paul knew, his authority that God had given him was greater authority than Timothy, was greater authority even more so than Epaphroditus. We know that, and that's biblical. He's not going around in pride flaunting it because he recognized that we need the Timothys and we need the Epaphroditus's and we need the, the, the Sarah's in God's word and the Ruth's in God's word and the Lydia's in God's word, etc. And the, the Stevens as a deacon in God's word, a fellow worker. A fellow soldier. I love that. We see the humility of Paul even in such a statement. It's a beautiful thing. In essence, Paul is saying we're all in this together. We're all in this together. Co-laborers in Jesus Christ is what we are. And we may have different functions in the body of Christ, my friends. Different functions, yes. But co-laborers within those functions. In your home, there are different functions in the authority structure and the nuclear family which God had set and ordained. Now, even though there are different functions, yet you're co-laborers in Christ. Interesting. It's a beautiful thing. We may have various functions, you know, but, but all have something vital to bring to the table. Paul recognized the importance of a team, a team effort. You know, everyone may not be a project manager, and thank goodness. Everyone may not be a foreman. Everyone may not be the construction worker. Everyone may not be the general laborer. That, that, that was me for one day. <laughs> I was like... I don't like this job. I'm going to try something else. I was really young and wet behind the ears. I'm like, 
I was like, no, that, you know, I don't know. It just wasn't doing it for me, you know. I, I, I have no problem with, with you know, uh, dirty jobs or whatever. I don't know. For some reason, it just, it just, that just wasn't for me. But, but, you know, everyone is not called to be a laborer or to be a foreman or to be a, you know, or, or, or the construction worker or this or that or whatever. But we're all called to the different parts that we are in the workplace and in the family and in government and in the body of Christ. Know where God has called you and serve him faithfully within that call and recognize that we all need one another together. We all need one another together. What good would a project manager be without the foreman? What good would the foreman be without the construction workers and the laborers? Nothing. No good. Nothing would happen. Nothing would be built. And in the body of Christ, nothing is built unless we all come together. Every one of us comes together. It's not just my job to come together. That's not scriptural. It's my job to give you God's word. It's my job to rally you. It's my job to bring correction where that's needed. It's my job to bring protection where that is needed. But it's all of our job to understand that we have a job in the body of Christ. Each and every one of us, co-laborers in the body of Christ, a part of ultimately a part of his team. We see how much this fits the church. Again, the same should be in our households. Then we look in the Old Testament. We see Moses and Joshua. Joshua was such a great second to Moses. And he did exactly what God called him to do. And then God had put him in the position that Moses was in at some point. But, Mo- but Joshua was quite content in where he was. Wherever God has placed you in your life, can we learn to be content in all things like it says in God's word? Wherever God has placed you in, be the best in that you can be. Be the best in that you can be. What is it? Be all you can be in the army? Well, we're in God's army now. Be all that you can be in God's army. We can look at Paul and Barnabas, a wonderful team in Scripture, we could look at Pastor back in the day, Pastor Chuck uh, Smith and Romaine, a wonderful team, co-laborers in Christ, beautiful team. Here they did the work together, they did the work together, and they did war together. Spiritual warfare, that is, they did battle, battle together as soldiers in Christ. Second Timothy chapter two, verses three through four. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. We are called to be soldiers in the body of Christ, soldiers in God's army, not to be entangled in the affairs of this world, but recognizing that we are enlisted by God. Do we recognize that we are enlisted by God? And what a wonderful service that truly is to be enlisted by God. In closing this morning, I just want to share something. This story that John Corson had had found, and I had found it through him, a, a wonderful story that just says so much. Because when we understand about being faithful, that means, as we talked earlier, look, sometimes we may be fearful, but we've got to press through that fear. Fear of telling someone about Jesus. Fear of, what if I'm going to fail at doing that in the, in the body, in the church, that I've never done that before? Well, I've gone through all kinds of failures in my life, but that's the best way that I learn, unfortunately. That's oftentimes the best way that we learn is through our failures. But by all means, my goodness, take your failures and use them to learn. Just because you may fail at something, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. You take that failure and you use it to propel you to learn something. But don't run from what God has called you to do. There was a man who ran. His name was Henry III, one of the great Bavarian kings. And when he first came to power, he was burdened, John Corson said he was burdened by the responsibilities and demands of being king. 
of being a leader. It's a chicken. I get it. Feeling pressure on all sides. He finally walked away from the throne. He's king. He's king. He's going to walk away from that. He walked away from the throne and went to a monastery. And this is what he said. I want to contemplate God and worship the Lord, he said upon arrival. Understand this, said the abbot. The first requirement of a monk, which is what you are saying you want to be and you want to leave your position as king there, the first requirement of a monk is that he's in total submission. A monk's life is not his own. Can you submit yourself to the Lord by trusting me? Yes, said Henry. Then go back to the throne. I love it. I'm like, that ah, is so unexpected. I'm like, that's fantastic. Go back to the throne. I'm instructing you to rule and to serve where God has planted you. And Henry III indeed did that very thing. He returned to the throne and became one of the greatest German kings in history. The inscription on his tombstone, I love this, gives the reason. On his tombstone, Henry III, the king, learned to rule by being obedient. The king learned to rule by being obedient. Such a man was Timothy. Such a man was Timothy. What about you? What about we, uh, you, me, us? We be faithful. Faithfulness. Whether we're faithful, called to be faithful as a leader, or whether we're not in any position of leadership in any way of our lives, and certainly we're speaking specifically, though, in the body of Christ, in, in pastoral uh, ministry. But maybe you're not a leader in any regard. Be faithful to what God has called you to. Don't run from what God has called you to. Well, actually, no, that, I, that's incorrect. Run when God has called you. Yes, absolutely run, but don't run from him. Run to him. Run to him. Maybe you've been running. Maybe you've been running for a long time. It's time to stop running, running away from the Lord, and it's time to start running, running to him. And you know what? It all begins with putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. There is only one way to be saved, and that is Jesus. And there are those that will say of me, well, you're so narrow-minded, Pastor. You bet I am. I'm very narrow-minded because this is the narrow path and the narrow way. Broad is the way, it says in Scripture, that leads to destruction. Broad is the way. Narrow is the path. Narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. Narrow is the path. What is that path? What is that way? Jesus is the way. Jesus truly is the way. He truly is the way. Will you put your trust in him today as the shepherd of your soul? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the examples that we have in your scripture, in your word. So many examples before us, O oh Lord, we have. Whether it be Moses or Joshua or David or Paul or Timothy or Paphroditus. In more modern times, Pastor Chuck or Romaine. There's so many others, Lord. who had to first be under-shepherds of Jesus Christ before they could ever be shepherds of what you called them to do. First, Lord, we see that they had a true and active relationship with the one and only living God. You are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. No man comes to the Father but by you. You also said when you talked to Nicodemus that unless a man be born again or born of above, from above, born of the Spirit, 
He cannot see the kingdom of God. There is no other option. There is no other way that you have provided, Lord. You provided yourself as the way. You made it so simple in making it a narrow way so that we're not distracted along the way. You said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And the greatest burden of all is not having eternal security. The greatest burden of all is being dead in your sins. The greatest burden of all is not having the assurance of salvation or walking with the Lord. Just trying to figure this thing out on your own. Today, will you just come to Jesus? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Put your trust in Him. It'll be the greatest moment of your entire life. You may say, well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. Well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am <laughs> or anyone else. But I do, know, I do know this, that we're all in the same boat together because Scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's the key. Eternal life. By the precious gift of Jesus Christ, who died as a substitutionary sacrifice to pay the price of your sins because you could never pay it. Will you put your trust and faith in him today to save your soul? I've done it. My sons have done it. My wife has done it. My friends here have done it. How about you? Today, as we're in an attitude of prayer, we're going to pray and give you an opportunity here to put your trust in Jesus, to have the same hope that, that I have that's an anchor to my soul. So if this is you today and you recognize your need, to be born again and I will tell you you need to be born again and you want the Lord to come into your life and make you new you want to have forgiveness of your sins and the slate clean then Jesus is the answer for you as we're in attitude of prayer this morning would you just agree along with me in prayer just right now just pray from your heart from your lips Lord Jesus I put my trust in you. There is no other way that I can be saved. But your word says that you love me. And you went to the cross for my sins. And salvation is of the Lord. And so today, Lord, I put my faith in you. May you come into my heart. May you make me new. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. May you forgive me, Lord, of all that I have done. I will walk with you from this day forward. And Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for those that have prayed that prayer today, that recognize their need to be saved. Lord, I pray may you strengthen them and grow them in the faith. And Lord, we pray for all of us that are in here today. May we be faithful, Lord, to the call. May we acknowledge those that are faithful to the call. And may we live to the glory of God as long as you give us breath. Lord, we praise you and thank you. Lord, I pray for any and all that are in this room today that are just going through it. It's been a tough week, tough month, maybe even a tough year. Maybe your heart is broken over a situation. Maybe you've been dealing with some issue in your life. Jesus loves you. He loves you. Take it to the Lord and then take it to the Lord again and take it to the Lord again. He's well acquainted with our tears. 
He knows our sorrows. Will you just continue to give it to him and ask him to give you strength? Lord, we praise you and thank you. Be glorified, Lord, in our lives. In Jesus' name, and all God's church said amen and amen. Let's